Uh, not yet. I would wait another minute. Okay. I'm just making sure. Okay. I've got it recording now. I'm going to go away. I'm going to turn off my video and my, um, my sound. You might still see my name, but the panel, the attendees won't. Um, and like I said, when you do hit broadcast, um, which you can do right when my video turns off, <clears throat> it, it might be delayed a minute on the attendee side. So just say like, we're waiting for everyone to join and then you can go ahead and get started. But um, Tina doesn't have to do anything, right? She just, um... nope. So we're going to go now. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our conversation for Creative Women. I'm Veronique Chagnon-Burke, and we're just going to wait a little bit to make sure all our attendee can come in. And I can see the numbers are rising very quickly. We're up to already 661. So we're about to start shortly, just making sure everybody has a time to join us. And our, our four panelists as, are with me, very eager to uh, jump in the conversation. I think we also will be able to have a little bit of a Q&A. So at the bottom of your screen, you can see that there's a little Q&A button and that's the way to submit the, uh, the question to me. And then I'll be able to read it and we hope to be able to uh, entertain as many questions as possible. People are still coming in and I'm glad to see uh, as a little bit of a free uh, information, I want to also welcome and make sure that everybody knows that we have people from all over the globe today. Thank you for the webinar and, uh, and this possibility to meet virtually. We have people in Abu Dhabi, people in Japan, of course, people in Europe and in all the states uh, and a lot of states in the United States. So um, I'm really happy to be able to reach a, a, such a global audience today. The numbers are still rising, but I think um, I want to make sure that we have enough time to entertain all the questions we've, we've prepared for you. So again, welcome to our conversation for Creative Women Together. I'm Veronique Chagnon-Burke, the Academic Director of Christie's Education. Um, as I said before, you can uh, submit a question in the Q&A box at the end. And I just wanna give you a little bit of background. Uh, we are going to hear first from all our four panelists. I've asked them to prepare a questions where they can really kind of present who they are themselves and, and what do they think is there. Um, their, their career is taking them and, and some things like this. So they'll have the floor, each of them for five minutes. And then we'll hope to have a couple uh, of, of more rounds of questions and then open up to the audience. But before I wanna make sure you're familiar with all our uh, panelists, we'll, we'll start with Regina Boga, who is uh, an artist that's been with us and uh, practicing artists since the late forties. Our first show was in 18, 1948 and uh, what is amazing for me is that um, among the landmark show that have marked our great career, there is a show by Lucy Lepard in the 70s and then a recent show at the Maid Broyer. So we look forward to hearing from Regina, who is also represented by uh, the Jeuchère Gallery. And then we'll hear from Florian de Saint-Pierre, who is a collector, who's focused on collecting practice of women artists. And I think for us, she has... Uh, made an effort to actually manage to give us the couple of like um, red uh, threads that have uh, kind of helped her focus our collection. She's also uh, an entrepreneur, but more importantly, she is the director of the Friends of the uh, Centre Georges Pompidou. Mm -hmm. And also more, even dearer to my heart is the fact that she's very active in a brand new association that I will want everybody interested in women artists to be more aware of. It's um, an association called AWARE, which is dedicated to uh, the research, the art historical research on women artists. And um, very easy acronym, you can just uh, find AWARE and it's, it's spelled as it sounds. So uh, welcome Florian. After that, we'll have um, Genoese Jocher, who is the founder 
um, with her husband Bernard, who unfortunately left us in 2017, of a gallery that was first based in Paris and then is now has been in, in New York for quite a while, a good 10 years now. Uh, she'll tell us a little bit about also how she came to come to New York and which is the very important woman artist that kind of, uh, in, in, you know, impressed her and, and, and gave her the, the kind of agency to come and join us. And then finally, we have Barbara Steele, Dr. Barbara Steele, who is uh, a curator and an art advisor who uh, will join us to talk to us in a more general way about the relationship of and the role of the curators and the gallerist in, in that larger ecosystem, trying to figure out how do we deal with the public and how do we change our perception of the place of women artists in, in, in our rich artistry. So this is very, very quick introduction to all of us. And uh, welcome again to the 152 people, 53 people that have joined us. And now I would like um, Regina to maybe take the floor and um, give us a sense of, of, of our career. Thank you. Hi, I'm Regina Bogat, a painter. I was born in Flat, Brooklyn, New York in 1928. Fortunately, as a child, I was placed in the gifted program in the public school system where a WPA art teacher, Miss Silasche, showed us reproductions of Van Gogh's work. From the moment I saw Van Gogh's Starry Night, I knew I wanted to be a painter. Miss Silasche told my parents that I had artistic talent, so they sent me to the Art Students League in New York. And at the Art Students League, I became the monitor for William Barnett's class. At Brooklyn College, I studied with Taylor, influenced by the school. In 1908, to show Miss Francis the temporary art gallery in Manhattan. She accepted my work for her new artist's group show, and this was my first show. In the 1950s, I showed at the Terrain Gallery and was part of USA 58 at Madison Square Garden. The biggest challenges for me as a young woman painter were poverty and the male-dominated art world. Even though there were plenty of women gallerists and collectors, men had almost all of the shows and were taken seriously by collectors. I had to juggle many paid jobs to keep painting in the studio. Women weren't welcome at the Cedar Bar or the Artist Club, which was very important at the time. In the late 1950s, I met Elaine de Kooning, who became a very close friend. She let me watch her work so that in her studio, an abstract expressionist had a lasting impact on my work. In the 1960s, I was a docent at the Whitney and took a studio at the Bowery. Mark Rothko had a studio across the hall from mine and we became great friends. He let me assist him in his studio and he encouraged me to continue painting. I married Alfred Jensen in 1963, and we traveled through Europe and Central America, studying art and ancient ruins. In the 1960s, I became close friends with Eva Hess, whose use of non-traditional material influenced my work. During the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I continued to work and have shows. Some highlights were being part of Women Choose Women in 1973, and one person exhibits at the Sid Deutsch Gallery on the Trenton State Museum. Things began to pick up for my work in the 2000s. In 20, one person show at Ellen Rand's Art 101 in Williamsburg, 
where Gwenole and Bernard Kirscher saw my work. I was taken on by the Zersha Gallery, who taking, who taking no notice of gender, put my career on the fast track. Since then, I've been included numerous, in numerous international art fairs, one-person shows, and collections, including being a part of the permanent collection of the Centre Pompidou, the Blanton, and the Met. Francis Barth also did a documentary Regina B. I think that all the efforts of the feminist movement had results which helped my career since the 2000s. Regina, thank you very much. This is a very, uh, a very good and uh, 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 it's, it's wonderful for us to be able to, to be able to have you who's seen so much and done so much. And I just showed very quickly uh, the selection of work you had proposed for us. And um, so people could see from the 60s, as you, 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 you explained, all the way to, uh, to, to, your, to your newest work. Uh, and, and thinking about this one, thinking probably about uh, your, your comment about Eva Esser, which I thought was very interesting. And I hope you'll have time in the second part of the presentation to speak to us more specifically about the work. And I'll, I'll share again the screen because I have some questions to ask you about this. So um, thank you so much. And I'd like to ask Florian now to tell us a little bit more about ourself uh, as Regina did. And I will uh, sh uh, share the screen also so she can take us through uh, the, the uh, Thank you. Day. Thank you, Veronique. So basically, my collection is a, is a woman's story. I was introduced to collecting by my mother. And in fact, it is thanks to this woman on this painting that my collection was refocused uh, probably seven years ago, um, only dedicated to women's artists. It was when I discovered that this uh, woman, who is my great grand aunt, <laughs> made commissioned a woman painter in the 19th century to do a portrait. And I was very intrigued by this portrait because she looks like a king. She doesn't look like a queen. It's really like, I mean, really like Louis XIV. And I was very intrigued as well because, I mean, the woman painter she commissioned was Frédéric Vallée-Bisson, who is, I mean, probably unknown today. Frédéric Vallée-Bisson was a student of Renoir and had a daughter with Renoir. And in fact, she was also the vice president of the union of the women painters and sculptors. And that led her to travel to the US for the world exhibition in 1893 in Chicago. So I was very intrigued about this woman of society who commissioned a woman a painter who had a very free life and I decided that I will right away when I discovered this focused on uh, women's artists only. So this was seven years ago. And let me share with you probably three directions of our collection. Of course, when I think about women's artists, um, this question of portrait is absolutely the way women represents themselves for me has been very, very interesting. And there's a key uh, red, fil rouge, red thread in the collection. Here we have on the left, Greta Stern, who, as you know, was um, a German key photographer of the avant-garde and then moved to the Nazism to Argentina. Um, she's, she has her self-portrait in the middle of this beautiful photography. And on the, on the right hand, we have Romanian-born American artist Edda Sterner, who, in fact, when she was in Romania, did this abstract surrealist collage. Mm -hmm. And this is the way she represented her in the 30s. Um, next. Here we are moving in the 70s with Annegrete Soltau. Anna Greta Saltau is a very interesting German visual artist born in 1946. And she was shown in the US in the famous WAC, uh, Art and the Feminist Revolution, a few years ago. So it's a self-portrait again 
where she uh, cut and sew her own images. And I think that the thread <clears throat> is always something also very typical to the work of uh, women's artists. Another dimension of self-portrait is that we want to cover uh, the 20th century or the 19th century with my grandfather grand all until today, and also all geographies. So here is Anneli Muley, um, who uh, since uh, years now only dedicates to self-portraits. And this is a self-portrait that I like very much because it is with her partner, Zava. Um, and she is, as you know, South African. This is Michaelen Thomas, Les Trois Femmes Noires, which relates to the Three Graces. And Michaelen is on the left side of the picture, so another kind of uh, self-portrait. And on the right hand, a wonderful uh, woman artist, Lebon Kanye, who lived in South Africa and whom I discovered at the Biennale de Bamako a few years ago. So now from portrait, let's move to a completely different uh, dimension, which is abstraction. And in fact, as you know, uh, the Centre Pompidou will uh, dedicate a major exhibition, the Femmes Abstraction, Elles font l'abstraction, Women in Abstraction, next year in 2021, which will allow uh, to rediscover uh, the role, the very important role of women um, as uh, in uh, to abstract the very important contribution of women to abstraction. So here are some uh, pioneers of photography. Carlotta Corpon, who is American and who has joined since a few years the collection of the Centre Pompidou. Lou Landauer, German-born, had a studio in Berlin then had moved to Palestine in the 30s, in the late uh, 30s, and just after the war, World War II, established the first um, school of photography in uh, Jerusalem. So she worked with photogram um, before in the 30s and later on in her career. Check Bella Kolarova, this amazing um, abstract uh, photographer and also artist because she worked on collage. Then we continue with abstract artists from all geographies. On the left, Aude Bertrand, and on the right, uh, the amazing Geneviève Kless, who passed away uh, uh, last year. In the middle, we have Ida Lansky, uh, who was also, like Barbara Cortron, uh, based in Texas, American. And next to her on the right, we have Dora Maurer, the amazing Hungarian artist who um, is, um, has expressed herself in many ways, but namely abstraction. Thanks to you, Renale, I discovered the work of Kazuko Miyamoto, uh, can we, can we, yes, here, Kazu, Kazuko Miyamoto, um, very interesting Tokyo-born American, uh, she lived in, uh, in New York, very, very interesting artist with a, a, a major exhibition, uh, namely in Paris um, at Padeus Ropac, and thanks to uh, Dugenolea being rediscovered. Then next, also, I mean, uh, abstract woman, Dorothy Tanning, very important, but partner of Max Tanst, Louis Janin, who discovered the cosmogram, uh, who invented this cosmogram, and of course, the Hama, who we know her as a photographer. She's an amazing abstract artist as well. Then the last section is dedicated to feminism. I couldn't not cover feminism in a collection dedicated to women's artists. And I've started here with a piece that is recent from 2016, is a neon from Israeli uh, artist Yael Bartana. What if women rule the world? And I think that the question is still open today. Uh, feminism, of course, we have a big section uh, dedicated to feminism of the 70s, late 60s, 70s. Here are a few examples from various geographies. François Janicot, En Coconnage, Performance and Photographies. Renate Bertmann, uh, who represented Austria at the last Biennale of Venise. Um, 
of, on, the, on the top right, Eva Partou, she's Polish, lives in Berlin, and questions self-identification. And of course, the very well-known image of Ulrike Rosenbach, art is a criminal action. To conclude, we all know this uh, work from the Guerilla Girls. Um, do women have to be naked to get into uh, the Met? And this work, uh, this work is, uh, I mean, I have a poster in the collection because it's, uh, it's important dates from 1989. <laughs> I was extremely intrigued when I discovered that and we move to the next slide, thank you. I was very intrigued when I discovered that Anna Kutera, who is a Polish artist from the avant-garde, absolutely asked the same question in 1985. And the three uh, portraits that you see on the left are photographies of, of course, very well-known works, um, uh, classic uh, paintings, she just put red lipstick, and then you cannot read here, but what is written in Polish and in English is exactly the same thing. Do I need to be uh, naked to sit in, um, in, a, in a museum? Um, this was 30 years ago, and definitely now time has changed, and fortunately, uh, women's artists have um, a big... Um, I'm very visible now. A lot needs to be done. And this is uh, with the chair of the board of the Friends of the Pompidou now also what we are working on to uh, support acquisitions. Thank you. Thank you, Florian. Um, and, and thank you also for, for sharing with us some, some very fascinating work and, and um, helping us to understand that Indeed, and this is something that will make a great link with Barbara and even with Genoli. This this commitment with women, not just photographer but also abstraction, is something that's quite interesting. And and um, and also thank you for sharing uh, one of the uh, about the, the Centre Georges Pompidou. One of the questions that I hope we'll be able to ask to, uh, later is actually regarding these um, you know these new different announcements that some museum in the Uni United States have made about DS deaccessioning some of their work in order to uh, create uh, a fund to uh, help underrepresented artists, women and other uh, to, to, to be acquired by, by their collection. So I think that's a, a, very, a, a very relevant topic. And as we're talking about this idea of the agency of women in the art ecosystem, we also start to understand, listening to Florian and, and, and listening to Regina, that there is a, 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 the necessity to have these relationship between the artist and the, right, uh, and the collectors. But I want to um, give the floor now to Guénolé, who is going to be able to let us know a little bit about our position and how uh, she has uh, committed herself and, and contributed to bringing back uh, that, that, that work that we're all doing, participating in one way of, of, of bringing back to the fore the women artists that were part of, of the avant-garde. Um, Genole, I will uh, start sharing my screen so you can have... So Veronique, let me see. Yes, go ahead. Do you, do you, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. So very, very let, let me thank you first for uh, this brilliant idea and for your time and efforts in putting everything together. Um, uh, for oh, well. Yana, Barbara, for accepting this invitation, notwithstanding your very busy agendas. And dear Regina, for your ongoing enthusiasm. Um, so I am going to tell a little bit, um, um, well, this is Regina 1959, but I thought I would um, give um, uh, the audience um, some uh, guidelines about who, uh, who I mean, who, who is uh, Zurcher Gary, who, uh, who, who are we? We started out in Paris. Um, I started out with Bernard, my husband and partner. Uh, Bernard was an art historian. Um, in 1992. We opened a branch in New York in 2009 and uh, everybody's going to ask why because this is quite unusual. I mean very very few uh, Paris galleries have uh, done so. 
Well, um, we wanted to expand. I think we were a bit done actually with France. Uh, <laughs> earlier <laughs> on, um, we had much earlier on, we had met uh, and we became uh, close friends with Joan Mitchell and she gave us a big push. And uh, so that was very important to us. And she's still one of the most inspiring persons uh, to me every day. Uh, and then we met in New York, uh, the New York collector, I met Ertigun, um, Atlantic Records, who became a huge supporter and collector of the gallery, buying, acquiring uh, Marc Degrenchon's work and uh, uh, Wang Keping, the historical Chinese artist you may know of. And so he, um, I met Ertigun, um, unfortunately just passed um, three months before we opened in New York, but, you know, he, uh, you know, he just uh, made everything, um, just encouraged us and just, we could not, uh, you know, just uh, go back, we just could not give it up. So, um, <laughs> I, I want to say a few things are how, uh, what's important to me, uh, what were our business models, um, uh, first in Paris, on one side, of, so on one side of the Atlantic, um, uh, Bernard actually was very uh, impressed by uh, someone called Pierre Loeb. I don't know if it is, it's less known than Pierre Matisse, who uh, is really well known in the States. But Pierre Loeb uh, was a great discoverer. He did um, the first solo show in his gallery of Juan Miro in 1928. And then he showed Picasso, of course, and Guinere, I think you're frozen. I think we we seem to have lost Guinere. Can yeah. everybody hear? Yeah. Um, let's hope that she comes back. Genules. Um, Barbara, do you think you could? Uh, I'm, I'm, hope, I'm, I'm just hoping Genules is going to join us again. Um, and but I, I, I would maybe like to have. Do you have the floor so she gets settled and, and get and get organized? Would you be telling us, could you tell us a little bit more about um, how you uh, got interested in, in, in women artists and how they've become really a central part of your, uh, of your practice? Of course. Um, I, have two, uh, I have two images for you, isn't it? Uh, yes, so you have to start with uh, the Beckman one. Yeah. And so, um, so my involvement with women in the art world actually started not with an artist, but with an art collector. And um, this is her portrait. Her name was Kete Rapaport von Porada. She went by Kete von Porada just because during the war um, and the rise of uh, the National Socialist in uh, Germany and in Austria where she lived, it was better to hide her Jewish identity. Um, I discovered her um, because I'm a scholar of Max Beckman um, and um, I contacted her family at the time, her two daughters, and they declined to talk to me because her mother, in order to have a life in the arts, had to abandon her two children, which already for me, um, I thought, well, this is remarkable that in order for a woman to be able to follow her passion, whether an artist or an art collector or an art promoter, that uh, in fact, Keta von Porada I discovered was um, all three. She was also an artist. She had to renounce her family life. Uh, so that was an eye opener for the student that I was. Of course, I had um, great admiration for people like Paula Modersen Becker um, and other uh, German uh, women painter that were um, uh, very often uh, spoke of by the men of their generation as, oh, she's a great painter for a woman. Um, and that for a woman, 
uh, was always the little something that of course bothered, uh, bothered me. There were so many untold stories and so many mistold stories about women artists and women in the arts that I decided that it was um, something I really wanted to um, spend more time mm -hmm. making visible in my art historical practice, whether it was by writing, by researching, or by uh, exhibiting. So the very beginning was with Keto von Porada. She is somebody who had a, a oh, life. Sorry. That's okay. Who had a life that is uh, a little bit like um, the Ifkusi in uh, the hair with amber eyes, mm -hmm. over continents and you know losing her collection, living in a in a um, um, closet during the war, resurfacing after and meeting the meeting Du Buffet, becoming great friends with him, and finally reconciling with her two daughters. Um, who I met and discussed with um, about, you know, their, their mother's creativity and her, their mother's past in the art world. So that was the, the very beginning. Um, there's nothing more satisfying for me, though, as an art historian than to be actually in dialogue with contemporary women artists uh, and women art collector, I should say, uh, because this is all about a community of um, people engaged uh, and um, who are uh, holding on for the long term onto uh, a mission, which is to correct these um, uh, gaps in history, uh, the scarcity of scholarship and visibility, and um, being able to uh, give back a place um, to this wonderful artist. One of the questions that I asked myself was, what are we so afraid of, right? Why mm -hmm. is it so scary? to have two genders creating, um, and, and, and why should that be? Um, and so that it's always puzzled me, and you see this step-by-step um, -step softening and people being less and less afraid. One has to say that um, this is not only, it's, I, I wouldn't blame men for that, that in fact, most women that had had visibility in history was thanks to a man, their father, their brother, their husband. So this is a larger societal issue that um, uh, I want to point out. One of uh, the, um, the major uh, moments in my um, creatoring life was to do a studio visit with a land artist named Michelle Stewart. Uh, Michelle Stewart is formidable. She's, uh, her work is now at DIA. She's, um, very well recognized, and yet there has been no retrospective for her in a major museum so far. Uh, when I went to visit her and I saw 50 years uh, of work, and that had not been um, visible in one of the major institutions as a retrospective, I was shocked. For me as an art historian, it was so exciting in a way because it's so easy to look at 50 years of work and within seconds realize this is so major, right? It's not when you're going to see a studio of a young artist and you're like, well, this is really great and super exciting, but you don't know what's gonna happen next year, much less in 10 years to come or 20 years. Here was a lady with 50 years of work. And um, I spoke to Buenole at that point and I was like, there are all these mighty old ladies. And I say that with all due respect. And I was so enthusiastic and I started doing more and more studio visits. And you see me here on the picture with Samia Halabi, who's definitely one of these mighty um, old lady ventures. And she's gonna scold me for saying that she was not. <laughs> it's not the point. The point is that there is all these bodies of work that have been um, developed in parallel um, with everything that was going on in the art world, in the art market. And when you look at um, these uh, incredible creative forces, it corrects the history that is official, right? It um, puts it in a new perspective and you realize that the history, for me, I love abstraction. So the history of abstraction is much more complex than the one that has been told so far. And um, it's been incredibly exciting um, to collaborate with uh, like-minded people some, um, in museums and in uh, galleries and in the art world, uh, the collectors and artists to try to, um, again, you know, give more visibilities and correct the mistold stories.
Thank you, Barbara. I think this is what I, I like about that conversation, and we'll get Genole to come back to speak to us, is that obviously what is at the same time exciting is that we have such a rich history that we can all rely, a rich history, and you're right, we're lucky because we still have some great practitioner like Regina, but others too that are part of that tradition. So we have the history, there's still a lot of work to do. There's a lot of excitement, and, and it seems like in the last five or six years, the stars are starting to align and a lot of initiatives are starting to really happen. But uh, before we open up a little bit to more question, I would want Genoli to come back and, and, and tell us more. So I'll go back and, and show some more images, Genoli. You, are you back with us? Genoli, can you, you have to unmute yourself. Do you hear me now? Very well. Good. Wait, Genoli, you're muted again. Uh, Go. All right, sorry about that. No, 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 it's okay. So I would Tell us a little bit about what... Um, yes, uh, 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 how, how the Garamay championed, uh, Zurich yes. Garamay championed uh, Regina over the years. So we um, actually, we had a first solo of Regina in New York in, in um, uh, November 2013. That's one thing. Then we showed Regina at Expo Chicago uh, in 2014. And Ver Veronica Roberts, the curator of the Blanton Museum, Austin, Texas, came to the booth and uh, um, uh, uh, decided to buy actually this painting, court painting, 14, 1977. And here you see core painting um, 14 installed at the Blanton next to Alfred Jensen, uh, Regina's husband. This is Mayan Temple, 1962. So, um, you know, this is, I think this is quite an achievement. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Regina was, of course, thrilled about that. Then we continued, we had a first solo in uh, Paris. And then we went on with, so can you go back to a freeze? Yep, the freeze. Um, yes. We had um, in May 2015, um, a solo, uh, Regina was selected by um, Adriana Pedro Pedroso from the um, Museum of uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. And here you see a selection of, um, I would say, landmarks. I mean, very, very mm -hmm. major works by Regina. On the right, we have the court painting, um, uh, then bought, acquired by uh, the Metropolitan. Uh, on the left, we have um, Quetzal, uh, 1968, bought by the uh, Marcel Brotes Foundation. Uh, here you have a um, woven painting one, 1973. Actually, mm -hmm. you can see uh, <laughs> back. <laughs> In the <laughs> flesh. Right, this is a great uh, acrylic cord uh, on canvas. Uh, here in the back, Aster, Aster 1967, wood and acrylic on canvas. And here, um, a very important piece from 1971, which was in Lucy Lippard's show, Women Choose Women, 1973 at the New York Cultural Center. So, um, you know, this, my booth actually was shortlisted as one of the best um, shows at Freeze. Uh, we won the second, uh, the Pomery, the second prize, the Pomery Prize, which was a lot of fun. We just uh, we got a bottle of champagne, which we uh, enjoyed with Regina. Remember, Regina? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was fun. Now here you have uh, the Metropolitan. So, so then we had uh, on and on, you know, we um, showed Regina and actually in uh, between 2013 and 2019, we had five solos uh, in New York. I produced four books on Regina's work, you know, going from one decade to the other. And then, um, so the Metropolitan acquired this painting, um, uh, painting 15, 1977, and here you see it installed um, in the great show Delirious, mm -hmm. uh, Art at the Limits of Reason, 1950, 1980, 
curated by Kelly Baum, a curator of contemporary art at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, here, she, um, uh, Regina is shown next to Eva Hesse's uh, Ascension. Um, so Eva Hesse being a close friend of Regina, I think this was a very in in mm -hmm. interesting. Um, now, can we move on, I think, to the last... The last slide? Uh, <laughs> last, 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 <laughs> um, and actually, this was Bernard's last uh, acquisition um, by the Centre Pompidou, thanks to Catherine David. Um, so here you see Phoenix on the Mountain 2, 1980, uh, wood, rope, and acrylic on canvas. Oh, my God. Again... Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, but I, I don't see an image. So. Um, oh yeah, no. There's the image. Well, I, I'm. I, I have the. I. I pointed. So again, Regina is shown next to Eva Hesse's um, yep. titled May 1970, Eva's very last uh, fiberglass and resin sculpture. A very, very important work. So, um, and then, okay, 2019, Regina was shown in the post-war women show at the Art Students League. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a show uh, many people saw, even Florian coming yes. from Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my plan, next plan with Regina, next step is going to be Art Brussels, where she's going to be in a show, solo show next year in Spotlight. And I am going to show Regina's, a selection of Regina's works from the 90s and uh, 80s and 90s. Thank you so much, Genole. And I think again, after Barbara's and after everybody's contribution, uh, the theme of the panel of the fact that it is about rediscovering, about perseverance, about endurance in a way, um, to, to see the role of the gallerist uh, 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 very, very specifically, nurturing the career of producing the books and the catalog, but also working with the curators in major institutions to bring to the fore uh, the importance of these artists. So again, it's it's no no one can do it alone, and and the curators. Are doing the studio they come to see you you do the studio visit uh, curators also write the catalogs the collectors also are very important in that ecosystem and what I'd like to do is um, go back to Regina and ask her because actually a lot of questions are um, a lot of questions are coming through the uh, uh, through the I'm gonna move people uh, through the through the the channel and I thought that Regina, you could, um, I'll put back your work. And um, the next question I wanted to sh ask you was to share a little bit more with the rest of us, your process, your creative process. And more specifically, this is something that's come of interest to me, is the, um, the, way, you, um, the way you think about your title. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do you mind talking to us a little bit about this? Well, yes, I certainly share with you where I get my. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you could tell us a little bit about your process and also how you come up with the title and, and, and really from the beginning of the inspiration to after. And I know sometimes your process takes a lot of sorting things out and not all the paintings make it at the end. So if you could share that with us, I'm happy to uh, scroll back to a painting you're more interested, but this was the first one you wanted to share with everybody. Yes, how the, how the bees uh, in nature, which was my for the hexagon, bees and hexagon sections in the hive mm -hmm. and I was fascinated because uh, my way I broke up uh, sections face itself to the forming of hexagons and some of them are not complete there's one to the right here that isn't complete mm -hmm. And the what happened? The uh, started using paint to relieve the 
the and it, it, the paint is so you just don't do something and it was very flat and so the the painted sticks mm -hmm. help make for a raised surface change the surface of the flatness of the canvas and, and I, Regina, Regina, I was going to interrupt you and ask you, you shared with me in an earlier conversation that one of the, um, one of the way you were able to persevere and, and work and, and sustain yourself even in isolation was the fact that you had to improvise when it came to art material. Is, is this is part, is that part of these different art material you were gathering? Uh, at that point, or is this made more or less with, with regular art, art supplies? No, this is not, definitely not. I, I, sh I should, instead of going to home ec class and learn how to make mashed potatoes, I should have gone to class with them and learned something about carpentry because I had <laughs> myself how to mop the corner. I didn't know anything. Carpentry, and it was very exciting. Everything I did from a ninth, in the early 20th century on was to forge into new materials, uh, express my because nobody gave a doing, and then, so I was free to do anything I pleased, and that <laughs> pleased to do carpentry for a while. I had a miter box and lots of glue. I know you, yeah. I, and then so another titles that I was very interested is, I, I love the way your work in the 90s become, you know, so interesting because it makes this kind of more gestural and calligraphic uh, stroke with a lot of um, interesting rays, uh, 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 pieces of wood. Could you tell us a little bit about how you come to your title, they, I'm, I'm very curious about that. Uh, the guy was a person. Uh, he was a very a dealer in sports cars, fan of very fast and had a Jaguar for many years. But he was uh, this special uh, Ford produced era. I don't think that Terrorism. But it was a charming little, car, very sporty. This one he wanted to sell me was in yellow and black. And this is a, a dedication to his speed because he loved to strap you into one of these little Pinteras and drive you around at 110 miles an hour. So, <laughs> and this is the speed. Of course, uh, to set the beginning and and the break and stick stick is a line that goes down to the right, separating the speed from the quietness from the break. No, I think this is a uh, one question that I, I I'd like to ask you now, which is a question that came through the feed of of, of the chats before I move on to uh, to Florian again is um, can you give can you give younger um, artists uh, uh, advice on what to do and how to work with their gallerist? Uh, this was one of the questions that was uh, that was asked earlier, uh, and and. Um, I, I'm, I'm very surprised by the question because I really have no one to give them except to stay, stay away from galleries so you really are. Mm -hmm. don't, don't try to become famous. We're not a rapper can become famous. Die up there. <laughs> I think longevity, the richness experience and age is a kind of mellowing that most young artists need more than ever. And in this terrible epidemic we have, uh, coronavirus, 
It gives you an opportunity to stay by yourself and be isolated and think about who you really want to do. One thing that Alfred Jensen used to tell artists, which was quite interesting, he said, remember who you were and rediscover your childhood. The, the necessity, and I think you're right, I mean, maybe one of the positive aspects of, of this terrible circumstances we live under is the fact that a lot of the artists have actually time. And, and, and you described to me before how important it was for you to have time and be able to be in your studio, even isolated in a way. That was a, an important part. Um, I'd like to segue and, and ask Florian um, if she could maybe talk to us briefly about uh, the importance of your role in that ecosystem. And, and this is in reaction. Um, and I know I had crafted so many questions, but we're getting so many great questions from the feed that I think I'm gonna use those as prompt. And people, um, people are asking a, a couple of really interesting things is, first of all, the role, of, the role that you see of the collector as a mediator between the institution, the private collection, um, and also the issues of women artists having to f um, fight basically the problem of ageism too. And, and, and how yourself, are you aware of this kind of things in, as you build your collection? And, and, and my last question to this, <laughs> very long, is ultimately, do you, do you also like to develop a, a, a personal relationship with the artist? Not all collectors like to be. I know that Genoli couldn't live with her artist, without her artist. She needs her artist. They're, they're what feed her and give her the energy. Uh, but I also know that some collectors may not be so comfortable actually um, meeting their artists. So a lot of question and unfortunately time is running really quickly. So uh, let us know. So I will start with the, I will start with the first one. Thank you, Veronique. So I would say that every one of us can do something. Um, I was really, I mean, really, I mean, the beginning of the story was uh, discovering this portrait before it was also the, my meeting with Camille Moreno when she was a curator at the Centre Pompidou and when she did Elle at Centre Pompidou. And so I realized that women artists were really, I mean, unknown, they didn't have, um, they were not recognized by institution. Galleries in the 20th century, especially in the first part of the 20th century, didn't give, a, give them a lot of visibility. So I think that all of us, each one of us, we can do something. So what I decided to do is to support AWARE, Archives of Women's Artists Research and Exhibition. It's the, it, it can give, I mean, the money you can, but also it can, give time, it can give, you know, support, it can give time. And then of course, um, you know, I, I admire a lot in the US, I mean, you really help institution, you help. So I decided that part of my life will be dedicated to uh, philanthropy. And that's the reason why I, um, I, I joined uh, the Centre Pompidou, first in the acquisition committee of photography uh, for the friends. Mm -hmm. and. The minute I sit in this uh, in this group in this acquisition committee, because I was known for my commitment, always it was half woman, half man. <laughs> People will never propose only men. Curators will never propose uh, men. And then the curator Carolina Lewandowska one day invited me for a coffee, and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, "You know what? I mean." You're, you're quite well connected, you should help us. And you have two options in that case. You can say no, or you can say yes. And she said, you know what? We should have a fund. You, the friends, you should set up a fund. And so I said, mm -hmm. yes. And then immediately I felt the pressure on my shoulder and said, okay, I need to set up a, fr a fund. And so I went to see I mean, a man, and um, this is really important. This is really a very important, a major collector. And it is the owner of Chanel, of the brand Chanel. And I know how he and his family has been committed to women, I mean, through Chanel and through art. And in fact, they have set up for the Centre Pompidou through the friends, a fund which is called the Chanel Fund for Women in Arts and Culture that fund our fund that fund also other initiative 
with the purpose of being philanthropic and transformative. It means that it's not about communication. It's not about uh, the, the visibility. Mm -hmm. and so we have set up this fund, which is really transformative with, um, with, with a, a selection of women's artists and work by women's uh, uh, artists that, uh, that are chosen by the creators. And we vote but that are chosen by the curators. And it's how really many women's artists have been able to join uh, the museum. I would say that as a collector, as an individual, as, I mean, a person member of the society, as a me person who is in the media, anyone could play a role to support the uh, visibility of uh, women's artists. Thanks, Florian. Um... And I think, Genole, um, reading also some of the questions that come to the, through the feed, um, the role of the gallery, and it's true that, you know, when you look at some glamour aspect of, of the art world, we're, not, we're sometimes forgetting that there are galleries that have a very different agenda. And a few of the questions that have come actually is, you know, what is the role of, of your gallery in, in trying to um, try to support that ecosystem? And, and, and how do you think, uh, especially in the difficulties that some of the galleries are, are, are seeing now, the pressure of being in New York, um, how are you managing to basically continue your mission? And, and I know passion is great and very important, but it's not enough. So people are asking if, not if you have a secret, but how you actually, how you're doing it. There is no secret. I think, I think for me, it's passion. Passion is very important, but also resilience. I want to keep going. I want to keep doing what I am doing. So it's, you know, when I start, when I'm committed, when I decide to represent an artist, I am fully committed and I want to show the artist again and again and again. I want to insist. And I think this is this is um, the this is the real secret. Now um, you know I realized that there was a real and huge demand from women artists artists uh, hoping more exposure. And this is why I started the uh, my project Eleven Women of Spirit. Um, so Women of Spirit, femme d'esprit, um, was a term used in France in the 18th century. Um, that refer to female painters, writers, and intellectuals um, under-recognized by their uh, male contemporaries. And um, so I, I launched this project, and I'm, which is currently on view uh, at the gallery. If you want to come to Bleecker Street, come and check um, uh, 11 Women of Spirit uh, until next Sunday, um, check the hours. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have, we don't have time to make a, a, a full presentation, but I think you can check the homepage of my website mm -hmm. and uh, check the tour uh, by Stephanie Gaillet, uh, which I think is uh, it's just great. And but please come, this show is just very refreshing and I'm very happy about it. And I want to go no. and continue it probably next year, part three. I think one of the things that has been quite interesting in, in watching the gallery grow, Genelé, is also how, um, you know, we talked about solidarity and Florian talked also about how we can all play our part, is how, as you identified, the need from the women to be getting more visibility and how probably one leads to another, another uh, meeting needs to see another one, to discover another one, to do a, another studio visit. So indeed, um, it only has to happen in the long term. It's nothing can be happening uh, in, in a couple of days, which leads me to uh, maybe ask Barbara, um, uh, uh, not quite a final thought yet, but a, maybe a final thought, which is basically, um, some of the questions that people have come uh, that have come through, which is this idea of, you know, the relationship of the curator with the wider audience, and thinking also in reacting between the kind of freedom maybe that the gallery will have and the pressure a lot of the museums are feeling now. And uh, a, a question, especially referred to, um, you know, the museum in New York, um, which is 
deaccessioning the Pollock in order to make a fund. And we also know that Baltimore has done this. We also know that the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art has sold their Roscoe to be able to do a fund. So in a way, as we all play our role, what is the role of the educator, the role of the mediator in, in, in pursuing and continuing to, to make women more visible? Well, I think that as a, you know, as a scholars, educator, there are like three fields we intervene in. There's academia, where we do research, and that's essential. Uh, and that's definitely the first step, as you know, Veronique. Uh, you're mm -hmm. very involved in that. The, the research is fundamental because that's how you discover um, and, um, new documentation and that history becomes uh, a little bit more precise and is corrected. So that's the first, the first field of action for an art historian, I feel, and I'm very committed to, to research. The second uh, aspect is, um, uh, as outside of academia, there's a larger audience. I've been, I've been very blessed to have wonderful clients and, and, and students, whether in the museum world um, or um, uh, in uh, my you know, dialogue with, with collectors. I do think that um, the the passion that Genoni speaks of is contagious, right? Mm. And so being, bringing that passion to create a bridge uh, from an object to the people uh, that are um, here to, usually if people come to an art historian to start with, it's because they're interested. So you already won half, you know, the battle. And then your passion is what drives you and speaking passionately about what you believe in, I, I feel is the best communication possible. When you do, when I do, um, uh, I see my role as, a, as really a mediator. Uh, between the audience and the art object, and sometimes between the audience and, and, uh, and an artist. Of course, it's very different if the artist has passed or if the artist is alive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as art historian, very often we work with ghosts and, uh, and we have these uh, fantasy dialogues with them with all the questions we could ask them. Um, when we're working with um, uh, a, a living artist, it's, it's much easier and we can ask them all the questions we want and then bring this right to um, to the audience we have. As an art historian, I feel that I have two populations. I have the links I have with the gallery, right? Um, to uh, speak about the artists that are either in the gallery or artists that I've seen and that I really think are deserving of, uh, of more visibility. Um, there is, um, the gallery's role, I think, and the relationship with the critic is essential uh, because there's a feedback. It's very, it, everybody believes in stories, right? And a story can accompany abstraction as much as it can accompany figuration. Mm -hmm. And that story, that narration, the narrative that you attach, that kind of discourse you attach to an artist's work is what enables people to approach them to create that bridge, right? Um, so with uh, the criticism, art history text, catalog essays, all of this feeds the body of uh, text that is creating the possibility of better understanding and better see uh, a work. So that, that's one thing. The, I feel that very often galleries are on the forefront uh, with, with the uh, art historian and that um, we see, and we mentioned that when we were speaking, you know, uh, before that museums tend to catch up. Um, mm -hmm. Like Florian was mentioning is that, you know, the, the art collector, um, the trustee or comes to put pressure on the big art historical institution, which is at the end of consecration. And they, so they play catch up. So this is happening in the world and they have the resources, they have the authority to bring uh, powerfully uh, a new image. But that image is built um, uh, 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 before it gets mm -hmm. to the right? It's built in the academia, it's built on the terrain by uh, the galleries, by the work of the artists, obviously, that are prime first. And, um, but this, the last step I want to say is the museum. Um, and whether in academia you're researching on contemporary artists, which makes it a little easier, um, or historical figures, you know, I worked a lot on Annie Albers, it, takes a, it has different pathways, different dimensions, but it's just as exciting. And I agree with uh, Gwenolet that 
uh, you just got to persist, just like the artists we visit, right? And when I'm with um, Samia, we giggle all the time, Samia Halabi. And one of the things, the same with Regina, that comes through is the persistence, mm -hmm. um, just the persistence, never letting go. And um, uh, I think it's uh, Carmen Herrera in that um, beautiful little documentary about her said, I waited for the bus for so long, but mm -hmm. finally it stopped and she was 100 years old. Yeah. But it, so persistence, here you go, right? Uh, thank you so much, Barbara. I think, um, I wish everybody could actually see those wonderful messages that we have been getting. And actually it's more messages than actually questions themselves. And they do uh, thank Florian and Regina uh, very much for their contribution. And, and they talk about this idea of per perseverance and acknowledgement. I think that's also something that for me as an art historian is very important is, is not to say, oh, well, women artists are something that just existed. This is to actually help the younger generation to understand how grounded there that tradition has been and 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 being reminded of florian's uh, ancestor being part of the uh, the artist who was part of the union of the women uh, trying to advocate for just rights and actually exhibition rights and and doing a lot of job which sometimes may have prevented them from being too uh, daring because they wanted to be accepted i think is also very important so the history is uh, conserving the memory of, of the of the of the artist having the galleries nourishing and giving the possibility of the artist to actually work because that's so important um, and and I know we have to wrap up but I was wondering if any of you had uh, another question for Regina because uh, she uh, she's the reason why we kind of all got together today and I know she has a lot to share and I've spoken a lot so I was wondering if one of you wanted to uh, uh, say a last, a last word or ask her a last question. I'm sorry. Regina, do you want to, you want to have the last word and tell us what's your <laughs> next project? Thank you for calling on me again, Veronique. Uh, oh, you're welcome. Word is I'm going to keep on painting. I'm going to go on what I've always done. I hope the, the museums in America and Europe and elsewhere become more interested in acquiring ladies, women's work, and their seriousness of it. And that's my hope for the future. Thank you so much, Regina. One of the other comments that we had was, um, can we talk about the men that have supported women? And of course, I think Barbara said it very clearly. This is not just an exclusionary world. And uh, we, we could have told the story of Sol Lewitt, who was probably the greatest collector of women artists, but that's another uh, story for another day. I feel that um, this has been extra, extremely um, accelerating for me it gave me a lot of good energy i have now 15 other ideas of other panels so um i want to thank all our uh, attendee there was nearly 200 people we have about 26 comments and i really can't uh, uh give credit to everybody but um i want to wish regina many many more years of uh of, of painting and even if you have to scribbles and and steal paper in your house until you go back to your studio keep doing it and um, looking forward for um, obviously visiting Guénolé's the Les Femmes d'Esprit Women of Spirit very spirited title and um, seeing all of you soon in another zoom so thank you very very much and uh, we're going to keep on working and 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 the passion and perseverance is what's going to sustain us um, well done. Thank you, Veronique. Thank, Thank you, Veronique. Thank you, Veronique. Thank you so much. Bye. I'm gonna, I'm Bye. gonna tell us till we next to our next conversation. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Oh, oh, Froyan. <laughs>